will spread out the madness across the city. Arkham Horror. Exterminate detectives in a style gritty. Arkham Horror. In Dunwich and Innsmouth and other worlds too. Arkham Horror. Insanity and death are what waits for you. great philosopher once said stop your grinning and drop your linen as this deluxe expansion is about to boldly go where none of these expansions have boldly gone before sure it may look similar arriving as it does in a flimsy box with barely enough integrity to make it to the recycling bin and yes it has some player cards plus five new investigators a campaign book with more story text than the silmarillion the typical one two scenarios which must be played in set order and, oh my word, an entirely new sheet of counters. The sky is literally falling around us. Fair question. Allow us to cut and paste you an answer. Arkham Horror the Card Game is a story-centered experience which is split into various chapters called scenarios. All of these together are called a campaign or a cycle. The core box had a mini campaign consisting of three parts. All the subsequent cycles had eight-part campaigns. They each begin with what is called a deluxe expansion, which usually contains the first pair of chapters, followed by six more individual scenarios called Mythos Packs. Both the Mythos Packs and the deluxe expansion will contain new player cards, but the big box has more player cards, some new encounter sets used throughout the campaign, and additional investigators. You are free to mix and match all your player cards and investigators from all of your products. You don't have to keep them separated. All up to speed? Then let's crack on. The Innsmouth Conspiracy is the sixth deluxe expansion for Arkham Horror the Card Game. Here are the previous ones. You don't need to own any of these items or even have heard of these products to purchase this one here. But you still need the core game box because it has all your tokens and some encounter cards which will be reused. This product adds 91 new scenario cards which is boringly average, plus 60 new player cards which again is unremarkable, along with 5 new investigators breaking the 565 pattern which was a nice little quirk. If you want a close look at the cards, there is a QR code on the rear that you can scan with a smartphone which gives you a preview of all the cards in this box. Well, it would if FFG pulled their finger out. Check out our Dream Eaters unboxing for what it should actually look like. And if you do find one that is working, beware of spoilers as it shows you all the cards, not just the player ones. The theme as described on the back is that of the shadowed and decrepit seaport of Innsmouth, made famous by the H.P. Lovecraft novella The Shadow Over Innsmouth, written back in 1931. We were probably still at school back then. If this is your first deluxe expansion, you will discover this comes in flimsy cardboard packaging. This is true of all these products. It is designed to look good on a store shelf and then be disposed of. At the end of each campaign, a product called a return to box is released, often two years later, which provides sturdy storage for your whole campaign cycle. These products come shrink wrapped and feel very light. They contain three packs of regular sized cards and a tiny Ziploc bag of mini cards for your new investigators. Remember to take these out before throwing the box in the recycling. Finally, there is your campaign guide, like you received in the core box, which has all the new rules, explanations and scenario instructions, plus story text, as well as the campaign log where you track your progress. You can photocopy this or print it out from the PDFs available on the FFG website. And, as is the new standard, it is 20 pages long. Awkwardly, the player cards and scenario cards are all mixed together, so let us show you the best way to avoid nasty spoilers. Pack number one has a player card back on one side, and a player card on the other. Sister Mary's signature bonus to be exact. These are all of your investigator signature cards, and all but one player card. The next pack has a scenario back on one side, and your missing neutral player card on the other. Below this card are five basic weakness cards of three types. Stop after the single copy of Day of Reckoning, card number 40, as below this are the story assets which you definitely aren't allowed to deck build with. This means the final pack must contain your missing investigator cards. Open it from the Underground River location side and work your way down till you see the double-sided investigator card. Below these, there will be a short stack of encounter cards. And you are done! Alright, keep your wig on! For the first time since the core box, we have a punch board of brand new double-sided tokens lovingly shrink-wrapped to keep them safe. Don't throw your box away without removing them. There are three or four different types depending on how you count them, and you'll probably need all of them if you're playing with the new content in this box. 
As it may have been a while since you unpacked your core set, remember to locate the side of the punch board that the cutting die has struck. That's this one here, not this one here. If you apply gentle, even pressure at the centre of the token, then they should pop out easily with no tearing. Let's try it again from the other side. Nice. If you get a bit of residue, then you can trim them off with scissors. First, let's look at the seven key tokens, which have a generic grey design on one side and a unique colour and key design on the rear. These are new multi-purpose objective markers. If you are a long time player, you'll be familiar with the various scenarios wanting you to use resource, clue, doom and even chaos tokens as tracking markers of various kinds, which can be a little confusing. Now, after four years, we finally have a dedicated solution, which the board game has had since day one, and is practically the same thing. Although it is early days, all the scenario instructions refer to each token by colour, using words, not by showing you the actual token colour or reprinting the symbol. So if you're colour blind, then sucks to be you! What you can do is compare the token with the picture on the front of the campaign guide to try and match up the symbol to work out which one it is, which is definitely a fiddly way of doing things and adds way more time to the already lengthy setups. The best thing about these is they are square and thus tactilely different from those other tokens which helps when fishing about in a bag. These keys do nothing on their own and any specific effects are described within the scenario itself. However, there are a couple of general rules about what happens if cards with keys on leave play. The next set of tokens are these round flood tokens designed to mark locations. There are 19 of them, which seems an odd number, but they have to account for the fact that you will probably lose some. They are double sided, with the pale side representing a partially flooded location, and the darker side signifying a fully flooded location. One side also has the planet spread out, and the other has them in syzygy. <laughs> we'll explain later. The rules for these are broken down to their most basic level, in theory making them idiot proof. What a shame they didn't bother to do this with other rules, eh? Finally, we have 10 new round tokens of one colour and 10 of another. These are the same dimensions as your chaos tokens, which is handy as that's where they go. The golden ones here are blessed tokens. When you draw one from the chaos bag as part of a skill test, they give you a plus two to that test and have you draw another token which you resolve as normal. The purple ones here are curse tokens. When you draw one from the chaos bag as part of a skill test, they give you minus two to that test and have you draw another token which you resolve as normal. They are also cumulative, so you can draw a blessed token that gives you a plus two, a second blessed token for a total of plus four, a curse token that takes you back down to plus two, a third blessed token moving up to plus four again before you finally pull a regular token and stop drawing. And as you can have up to ten of each token in the bag, you can be here for some time. What was once an elegant system of draw one random number then perform some simple addition has now bloated beyond all recognition, potentially increasing the duration and complexity of every single skill test you take. And if you hate the random nature of token draw, you will definitely want to flip the table and quit this game in disgust. But there are some saving graces. These tokens are not mandatory additions to this or any campaign. Your chaos bag by default contains no bless or curse tokens. They only enter the bag through player or investigator cards that specifically instruct you to do so, like this one here. And unlike the regular chaos tokens, once you draw a bless or curse token, you don't put them back in the bag. These are one and done modifiers that disappear, so it's unlikely you will end up with 10 of each in your bag. Unless you want to for some reason. So you don't have to introduce these into your games if you don't want to. Although, spoiler warning, some of the scenarios in the Innsmouth Conspiracy campaign may chuck in a token or two. Be warned. But from what we've seen today, it's not overwhelming. The bless and curse idea are mechanical staples of the Arkham Horror universe and you'll see them pop up in other games. The flood tokens are about 3 quarters of an inch or 19 millimetres, and the keys are fractionally smaller at 18 millimetres. The bless and curse are 25 millimetres or 1 inch in diameter, the same size as your coin capsules. Oh, we mean chaos tokens. It's been a long video, right? Each of them are the regular 2 millimetres thick. 
And yes, all your third-party manufacturers released their complimentary product before we even saw a copy of this box. Well, probably nothing can top the arrival of brand new tokens, but we guess there are some cards and stuff. You interested in those? All right, jeez. One of the most anticipated parts of any deluxe box is taking a look to see what they've done with the new investigators. Because this is an even numbered expansion, we receive six investigators. No, they stopped all that nonsense on account of releasing all those starter decks. Okay, five investigators, one per class, so Lola is still in a class of her own. All these have been seen in previous Arkham products, with two already appearing in their own novellas. Which means you may already have a miniature for them, from their premium line, or included with Mansions of Madness. We have Sister Mary the Nun, Trish Scarborough the Spy, Dexter Drake the Magician, Amanda Sharp the Encyclopedia Saleswoman, Student, sorry Student, Silas Marsh the Aquaman Body Double, Sailor, sorry Sailor, in summary, Mary is a guardian who adds the new plus two blessed tokens to the chaos bag. Frequently, Encyclopedia Girl is a seeker who draws an additional card each round, but you must put a card beneath her from your hand, which is either committed to a skill test or discarded. All right, stop the video. I am Future Lita. You can tell by my snazzy outfit and the fact I arrived by teleporter. According to the new FAQ, Amanda's investigator ability should be a forced effect rather than an optional reaction trigger, so you must commit that card each test if able. Trish is a rogue who, after discovering a clue at her location with an enemy, either discovers an additional clue or gets a bonus evade. Dexter is a mystic who gets to discard an asset he controls in order to play a different asset from his hand at a one resource discount. Aquaman is a survivor who gets to return a skill he committed to a test back to his hand. Plenty of innovation here. Class-wise, you have a Guardian Mystic, a Mystic Rogue, a Rogue Seeker, a Seeker that can take practice cards, and a survivor who can take innate skills. And crazily, everyone has a deck size of exactly 30. Going back to Encyclopedia Girl, the only practice traded cards are currently skill cards, and all 27 of them are level 2 or lower, with the exception of the Eye of Truth, which Amanda can take anyways, as it is a Seeker card. The only new one in this box is the Mystic card Promise of Power. For innate skills, there are 39 available, including these from the Circle Undone. The only new one in this box is Beloved. Again, the innate trait only appears on skill cards, with all cards released to date being level 2 or lower, with the exception of the experience rise to the occasion, which Silas can take anyways, as it is a survivor card. Look at those happy coincidences, it's almost as if they planned them. Moving on to the stats, things are almost symmetrical, with everyone having the popular 12 points, except Amanda with a mere 8 points, probably because she is expected to be committing a free card every turn. There are a lot of 2s and 4s, which is going to make you want to specialise, making these investigators ideally suited to multiplayer. The only 5 stat is on Dexter, which is still the exception amongst Mystics. Health and Sanity is very cookie cutter, and we haven't seen any innovation here in a while. Everyone gets 14 points, with a formulaic 5, 9 and 9, 5, plus a 6, 8 and an 8, 6, with Amanda picking up the 7, 7. Signature card wise, it is strictly one of each, apart from Aquaman, who is going for that gladiator look of Net and Trident, because you can't have two separate abilities on this same asset card. That would just be crazy. Mary's Guardian Angel is like a true grit that can also accept damage from investigators at connecting locations, and can also put blessed tokens into the chaos bag every time it receives damage. A Crisis of Faith will either turn those blessed tokens into curse tokens or make you take horror for each one. Encyclopedia Girl's Obscure Studies can switch places with the card beneath her during a test and has three wild icons. Whiskers from the Deep has minus one wild icon and the forced effect makes you place it underneath her at the next opportunity. In the Shadows gives Trish Stratus a mass disengage from all enemies, including elite ones, till the end of the round, but means she cannot deal damage to them either. But look at those four icons! Which she will probably need to use on her 5 evade value personal enemy, Shadow Agents. Dexter Drake can use his showmanship to give him a plus 2 bonus to any skills he uses with an asset he just brought into play. 
while his occult scraps is a weakness asset that reduces his willpower when in play, and even more when in his hand, which he can't play using the regular play action. Arthur Curry's pointed stick, Oi, cut that out! Silas's sea change harpoon enhances his already powerful combat skill during an attack and allows him to bring this item and any committed skills back to his hand after a skill test. Silas's net works the same way but for an evasion attempt and gives a free auto evasion on a second enemy, complete with the option to bring it and any committed skills back to your hand. Siren Call is absolutely brutal, forcing him to pay one resource for each matching skill icon he commits. Luckily, for just two icons, anyone can make it go away. As usual, we will give you a slideshow so you can have a read for yourself. After the shed show that was the Dream Eaters, things are back to normal. Very normal, in fact. Like most deluxe boxes, there are exactly four new cards per class, each of which comes with a reassuring two copies. Plus, you get a lovely level zero neutral as well. And everything, literally every card, is level zero, which is great if this is the only deluxe you can find in stock after purchasing your core box. Despite each class getting four cards, the split between the three types, asset, event, and skill, is definitely not even. The guardians are asset heavy with no skill card. The seekers are better balanced with at least one each. The rogues match the guardians. The mystics get the most event cards but achieve good balance. And the survivors have the same spread but lean towards the skills. Finally, your neutral card is an event card. Did you spot that there were no allies or any assets capable of absorbing damage in the whole box? That's quite a worry if this product represents half your collection. There are a couple of cancellation effects and a single healing card. As the new mechanic for this cycle, there are new Bless and Curse tokens you add to your Chaos Bag, the majority of cards from every class are mucking about with this in some way. In fact, only these 5 cards out of 21 make no mention of Bless or Curse. We do have an untranslated card for the Seekers, like the Strain Solution and its ilk we usually see every cycle. And it's cool that it makes you really screw yourself in order to translate it. Plus, it is really hard to maintain 10 of any kind of token in the bag without drawing and removing them. Let's see if the payoff is suitably worth it, shall we? There are plenty of blessed cards. A few spells and a rare occult card. A few assets. A few more assets. Plus some relics. 
and one tome Daisy can take and one she can't. No tricks, tactics or spirit cards this time round. We will leave you with a slideshow so you can scrutinise at your leisure. Again we have the bare boring minimum. There are three new basic weaknesses, none of which have any restrictions like multiplayer or a chain together in a sequence. A cursed follower is like Wizard of the Order but for curse tokens instead of doom tokens. It's up to you if you think this is better or worse, particularly as it will spawn at the location furthest from you and is aloof, as well as coming with two copies. Dread Curse is kind of the opposite as it adds curse tokens all in one go and is done. If the designers are drawing on Kafka for their nightmares, then this game is truly deadly. And there are also two copies. Finally, in a real shed storm, Day of Reckoning seals away your Elder Sign token. Granted, it rarely pops up and usually at the most useless times, but to take away your little glimmer of hope is just obscene. Luckily, there is only one copy. So, what happened at Arkham Knight 2018 to screw over future players so bad? Well, let's just say things in Egypt took a turn for the worse. Depending on the results of the Knights Usurper played at the US version of Arkham Knights, one of three weaknesses was to be added to the game. Which means we may, or may not, see Aspect of the Beast and Abyssal Covenant in the future. Wait, Covenant cards? That sounds familiar. Here is another 20 page single fold double staple campaign guide. Which definitely won't fit in your return to box when it eventually arrives. It begins with rules for the new token types on one and a half pages. Then the seal mechanic returns, which we haven't seen since its debut in the Forgotten Age. And that's it! So no swarming, alert, retaliate, haunted, myriad or whatever. Clearly this will be a cakewalk campaign. Next you have the expansion symbol, which is two heavenly bodies in Syzygy. <laughs> we'll get to that. Then the scenario setup begins and so we'll skip over 15 pages to the pretty looking campaign log. The back cover has a list of all the encounter sets in this box with their symbols to help you out when setting up these and future scenarios. Remember when they didn't do that? This is the comprehensive FAQ. Which isn't, so make sure you download the updated master FAQ from the FFG website. Then it is time for the credits, with a healthy sized pool of playtesters. And it's fun playing spot who will be elevated to the design team next. Work for Mr. Swern. He used to be down here, and now he's up here. Good on you, mate. Structure-wise, this is a regular eight-part campaign with the first two parts in this product and played in a set order. But just because they are mechanically in order doesn't mean they are narratively in order, with the second part actually a flashback that takes place five weeks earlier. You basically wake up in a cave with no memory of where you are or how you got there. And each scenario will fill in a few of the details, not to mention the flashbacks. Sometimes during a scenario you will be asked to stop playing and read a huge wodge of text from the rulebook. Back in our day text used to come on story cards, but now these are so massive they have to live in the campaign guide. And this is on top of the two regular interludes plus a third interlude that takes place during a scenario. 
How does that qualify as an interlude? This stuff is no joke. If you are a dyslexic gamer, have poor eyesight, are playing this game in a language other than your own, or even suffering a poor localization, all this text can be a very real challenge. Each cycle appears to become less of a card game and more of a game book. Pretty soon, the only thing your player cards will be used for is as bookmarks in a campaign guide the size of a phone book. They're too young to know what that is. Go outside and yell at some clouds, old man. Before you go, please do consider leaving a thumbs up on the video or checking out our literally hundreds of other Arkham Horror videos. Why not like and share this one to help more people find it? And if you want to see more videos from us, then you can always support our work over on Patreon. Oh, follow us on Twitter. Oh, and we never did explain what a synergy was. It's just a conjunction. Are you ready, cultists? I can't hear you. I lie, great old one. Oh, spread out the madness across the city. Arkham, horror. Exterminate detectives in a style gritty. Arkham, horror. And Dunwich and Innsmouth and other worlds too. Arkham, horror. Insanity and death are what waits for you. Arkham, horror. Let's go, Arkham.